The Loon Preservation Committee started in 1975, and it started because people were realizing that loons were becoming less common on our lakes. And the thinking at that time was that if human activities had contributed to those declines, and it seemed pretty likely that they had, then human activities, if they were coordinated and thoughtful, could reverse those declines once again. Loons are not listed federally as an endangered species, but here in New Hampshire, they're listed as a threatened species. What that means is if actions are not taken, they will likely progress to, be, to become an endangered species. In the state of New Hampshire, last year we had 326 territorial loon pairs. When we talk about a territorial pair, that's just two loons that will pair up, that will defend an area of water, and have at least the potential to breed and to contribute to that next generation of birds. The good news is that since we began our work in 1975, we have more than quadrupled the loon population of New Hampshire. So that's been great progress. Um, it has been slow growth. Loons are long-lived animals. You know, they don't begin to reproduce on average until they're five or six years old. We followed some loons until they were 10 or 11 years old before they began to, be, you know, first started to reproduce. Um, and then their reproductive uh, ability in any year is limited. So they have at most, they'll lay two eggs. Um, and some of those nests fail, some of those chicks don't survive. So by the end of the season, we're lucky to have a half a chick per pair per year in New Hampshire. Um, and that's pretty much the, the level of reproductive success that we know from research done by Loon Preservation Committee and other organizations that we need to maintain a stable loon population. And of course, we want to do more than just maintain. We want to continue to, to recover this population because despite over four decades worth of work and despite over quadrupling our population, we still think that we're only halfway towards a truly recovered population back to the historical levels that loons were in New Hampshire. Every year, the Loon Preservation Committee hires a number of field biologists. So this year, we have more than a dozen, um, if you count veterinary interns and conservation interns and outreach interns as well that we're hiring. We send these biologists and interns out to every corner of the state. Last year, we uh, surveyed 350 lakes for loons, and not all of those lakes have loons on them, but all of them have the potential to have loons, and we hope more of them will have loons in the future. So we deal with that large number of lakes by carving the state up into these different monitoring regions. We send our, uh, a biologist to each to, each of them has their own monitoring region. On a lake like Winnipesaukee, you know, this whole lake is covered by Ashley, which is a huge job, 44,000 acres of, of water and one person to cover it all. A typical day for me here on Winnipesaukee is I head out, I mark off an area of the lake that I want to check different territories. So within that area, I might have eight different territories. I go out, I'm looking for loons in those territories, I'm looking for bands, um, seeing if there's paired loons, looking for nests. If there's other rescues or calls that are called into the center, so that sort of leads me in a different direction, and so we answer any sort of um, concerns that we have. Um, about loons on the lake as well. We started building rafts as we experienced loons having lots of habitat as a way to sort of help them. Um, it offers uh, protection as water levels rise or go down, so will the rafts. It also, we offer cover for them, so that offers protection from other birds, eagles, um, and predators from above. It also offers, um, you know, a cool, a cool space for them, um, temperature-wise, um, so they're not exposed to direct sunlight all the time. Um, but we typically put them in places where the nest has failed over the years, maybe predation. This also keeps them away from the shore and hopefully helps them with that as well. Yeah, last year we floated more than 100 of them throughout the yeah. state and uh, one out of every three loon chicks hatched in New Hampshire came from a raft floated by a loon preservation committee staff person or volunteer. For me, I've grown up in the lakes region. I've always been drawn to loons. I find them to be just fascinating birds. They're beautiful. I mean, absolutely striking. They're fantastic parents. Their calls are like no other, and they're kind of a symbol for what I feel, you know, is, is just part of what I've grown up with in the Lakes region. Uh, the more I learn about loons, the more interested I become, um, because they're very much a unique bird. Um, their habits, uh, their nesting, their, um, their brooding style, everything about them is unique. And that can take me even further back to their evolution as like this water bird. They're streamlined to be this torpedo in the water. So everything about a loon fascinates me. And, and for me, it's just part of my heart that I just see them and I, I mean, I can watch them all day. 
So loons arrive back in our lakes in the springtime within days of ice out. And the first four to six weeks is really spent getting to reacquaint themselves with their mates. Indications are that they have separate winter vacations. So there's no, there's no real data that says male and female loons are spending their time together. Um, so they're reacquainting themselves or perhaps they're finding a new mate. That all takes a little bit of time. And then they get back down, they get down to the business of nesting. And typically peak nest initiation happens in early June, then they have about four weeks of uh, sitting on the nest, and a lot of times peak hatch of nest is right around July 4th weekend. And that can be a little bit of unfortunate timing for you know, these little chicks to be out uh, when the lakes get very, very busy, but typically people are very respectful. They, they maintain their, their distance from these loons, um, and they do all right in, in uh, raising these chicks over the course of the season. Yeah, and once the, once the chicks are born, uh, both parents participate in brooding their chicks. So they become this family unit and the parents are very protective. So at all times, pretty much at all times, uh, one of the parents will be with the chicks. Um, you'll initially, when the chicks are born, you'll see them, that's the money shot, right? When the chicks are on the loon, um, on the parent's back. Um, and then they'll sometimes hide underneath the wing. Um, parents are great. They're always looking out for, you know, boaters, for any any uh, potential um, harm that could be, um, they could be putting the, the chicks at risk of. Um, and so they, the parents will, will brood the chicks for the remainder of the season. So the parents will stay with those chicks. Um, they start to teach them how to swim, how to dive and slowly, but, and surely the, the chicks get a little bit further from their parents and sort of become their own individual. Loons can mate with the same pair for quite a few years, um, seven, eight, ten years. If, if the pair is working out, if both um, are still reacting to each other, if they're successful, then they'll continue to meet up and pair for the season. Um, but they do get challenged certain years, um, and so that can sort of stir up trouble on, you know, amongst their territories. Um, but they don't mate for life. That's something a lot of people think that they do, um, but they can mate for an extended period of time together. Uh, it's funny because I think that all the loons come here and initially it's all about breeding. We've got to get our pairs, they're very territorial and there's this drama that unfolds of, you know, having chicks. As the season progresses and the breeding season's over, what you'll find is large groups of loons starting to join together. And it's like all of this, this drama that started in early in the season subsides and they all kind of rejoin together. Um, and then during the fall, I believe they leave about, you know, end of September, October, they start migrating. And our loons here in New Hampshire typically migrate over to the coast. So anywhere from say, Southern Maine, um, and I believe they can be seen as far south as New Jersey. Um, but typically around the Cape Cod area, that's where they spend their winter out on the ocean. So that was a question for me um, over the years as I've I spend a lot of time at the ocean. Why in the winter am I never seeing a loon out there? Uh, well, before they leave here, their plumage starts to change and they turn to this like ashy gray color, which really blends them into their ocean environment. And then at the end of the season, um, what's, what's crazy to me is that the parents leave. So they're the first out of here back to the ocean and the loon chicks, um, you know, they're a good size at that point. Um, they will stick around here for about another two to three weeks before they instinctively know that it's time to get out of here. They head over to the ocean and then these loon chicks will spend um, about two years before they return. Typically they'll return to the same area. So we could have a loon chick return, maybe not necessarily to the same territory, but they'll come instinctively know to come back here to Winnipesaukee or certainly to New Hampshire. Um, and they'll start in the process of finding their own pair and their own mate and you know, fighting for their territory in, in hopes of raising their own family. I could not do justice to the loon sound. I can't make the sounds, but I will tell you that they have four different calls. So there's the hoot and the wail and the tremolo and the yodel. So the hoot is a very soft call. It's often given between mated pairs. I can't do it. I, I just can't give them. <laughs> but it's often given between um, a mated pair or a loon with, the, with their chicks or a small gathering of, of loons. Um, doesn't carry very far. It's just kind of a contact call. It's a here I am, where are you kind of a call. Then the wail, which sounds almost like a wolf howl. So that is a, a more drawn out version of that hoot call. And it carries across far, you know, longer distances. And so 
Um, a pair of loons, when they're at nighttime, they will fall asleep on the water. They're almost never on, on the land. Only if they're incubating um, uh, eggs will they be on the land. So other than that, both of these pair members will fall asleep on the lake at night. And over the course of the evening, they'll drift away from each other. And one or the other will wake up and they'll give that whale call and that will wake up the other um, pair member who will give the whale call back and then they'll move towards each other. So from that behavior, we infer the meaning of that whale call to be, here I am, where are you, come closer. Loons will spend a good proportion of their day preening and so what they're doing is just kind of working their, their bill through their feathers and that helps to keep the feathers aligned they actually have a uropygial gland in the kind of the small of their back and so every once in a while you might see them reach around and they'll actually coat their bill with oil from that gland and then they'll work that through the feathers and that helps to maintain the alignment of those feathers and it helps to waterproof those feathers as, as well. So they're in the water but they're warm and dry. They've got a, a waterproof coat of feathers. Loons will eat a large variety of fish, um, usually small fish though. Loons have no teeth so they need to swallow their fish whole. That limits the size of fish that they can eat. A typical prey item may be a yellow perch, six or eight inches long, something of, of that nature. Um, but loons can on occasion capture and swallow larger fish. And that's where they can get into trouble with lead tackle, you know, as well. Because if you're talking about a fish that's larger than an eight inch yellow perch, you're beginning to talk about a size of fish that could conceivably break an angler's line. And if that line gets broken, that fish is often trailing a length of line with a hook and a sinker attached to it. And that fish is gonna be a little bit slower than the fish next to it. It's gonna be swimming a little bit erratically. And that's the fish a loon is gonna zero in on as an easy meal. And when it gets the fish, it gets the hook and the line and the sinker as well. The major threat to loons would be lead fishing tackle. That's a huge concern that we have here. Um, when a loon consumes lead, um, it basically means end of life for that loon. Um, back in 2013, we started working with the state and um, it was in 2016 that lead fishing tackle to a degree that, that harms the loons became illegal in the state. So lead fishing tackle is a huge concern for our loon population. Um, also loss of habitat. Um, as we do continue to develop the lake and more people come up here to enjoy it, we're losing um, you know, different nesting areas. Um, so that's becoming smaller here on the big lakes for sure. You know, there's recreational use of, of lakes and, and so boating that doesn't take into consideration the needs of loons. And so if we're approaching loon families too closely, especially loon on the nest, that can be disruptive. So every, every year, despite our best efforts, we lose close to half of the loon nests in, in New Hampshire. Uh, to various causes. We don't even know sometimes what, uh, what those causes are, but some of them are human beings just coming too close to a loon on the nest, not realizing that they're now encroaching on that personal space of the loon. And it's actually, so a loon uh, that is relaxed on the nest is gonna have its head up and it's just gonna be looking around. But if people come too close to them, they'll crane their head flat against the nest. And this is the loon trying to make itself inconspicuous. And uh, from that, posture, it can also explode off of that nest if it feels endangered and leave that nest untended. So the good news here is that even if you flush a loon off of the nest, if you turn around and leave that area right away, chances are pretty good that in 20 or 30 minutes, that loon is gonna get back up on the nest. The danger though, is that on a really hot day, like today, those eggs can actually cook on the nest if they're uncovered. On a wet and rainy day, they can actually chill. Any one of those things, any of those temperature extremes can kill an embryo developing inside of that loon egg. And it also leaves those eggs exposed to any predators that are working their way along the shoreline or flying overhead and looking for an easy meal. So as you're approaching loons in a, in a boat, I think it's important to recognize that loons will communicate with you. And, and so, and of course the issue is that um, we're all wanting to spend time watching, having, sharing an intimate you know, moment in the life of these loons. And the problem is that as we continue to get closer and closer and closer to these birds, at some point they stop doing what they were doing, which is the reason why we wanted to, to observe them and begin to react to us instead. And so anytime a loon begins to move away from you or make any sort of vocalization um, or, or become you know, very kind of erect in the water or sink very low you know, down into the water, these are all signs that you're, in, you're invading their personal space now. It's especially true of a loon on the nest or a loon with chicks 
Um, but anytime you see a, a loon, really, um, it's best to maintain, you know, a decent distance from them. I always say that if you want to get close to a loon on the water, the best way to do that is with a good pair of binoculars. You know, if you want to take a picture of a loon, the best way to do that is not so much with your little iPhone, but buy yourself a nice telephoto lens so that you can watch them without altering their behavior um, and causing any sort of an impact to those animals. We hear um, stories from people who are boating and they had a loon, you know, uh, swim right under their boat, you know, and, and come up right next to their boat. The other day I was on a, a lake and a loon had all, the entire lake to come up with, but it chose to come up about three feet off of my canoe. And, and, uh, um, and it kind of like, it surprised me, it didn't surprise the loon, it knew exactly what it was doing. So it just kind of casually looked at me and then dove away. And I always say to people, if you have that intimate experience with the loon, sit and enjoy it because that's a loon choosing to interact with you on its terms. What we don't want to see is people, whether they're in boats or kayaks, um, chasing loons, you know, paddling after them and, and, and imposing that will. Uh, loons are very curious uh, animals and so at some point if you just like take off your cap and wave it around or something they'll cruise right on in to have a look at you and see what you're about uh, and in that case I say enjoy because that's the loon choosing to interact with you on its terms. There's a couple different loon cams that we set up um, and they're focused in on a nesting pair that have nested on rafts um, and you can go to the LPC website and get on our loon cam and you get to see live footage of this pair throughout their nesting time. So if you start to follow it you'll get to see great opportunities when they're turning their eggs, when male and female are switching, um, getting on and off the eggs um, and then there's even potential of seeing you know drama from you know other animals that could come into um, the nesting area you know it's just a great opportunity to experience up close like we all want to be to what's happening on these rafts um, without getting too close and you can you can watch their whole breeding season unfold we really do rely on our volunteers and we have close to a thousand volunteers throughout the state and they help with every aspect of the work that we do. And that includes the monitoring of these birds, the research to, to uh, help us understand some of the challenges, some of the threats these birds are facing. We turn that focused research into management to help loons overcome some of those challenges. And then overlaying all of that is the outreach and the education that we do to just make people more aware of loons and their needs. And it's really in those areas where we have been able to encourage a culture of respect and appreciation for loons. That's where loons have thrived in New Hampshire. We would love for people to get more involved in the Loon Preservation Committee. One of the, one of the things that we need to do is have volunteers to help, keep us, help us monitor these birds. So our work begins and ends with counting loons. So counting loons gives us our first indication of problems with our loon population. And it's the ultimate measure of our success in trying to keep these birds common. So we ask people, you know, the first time they see a loon on their lake or on their territory, give us a call. We would love to, to know about that information. First time they see a loon on the nest, uh, we would love to hear about that the first time they see chicks uh, and, and whether or not those chicks survive the summer. Also, we would love to have help with putting out rafts and putting out signs and rope lines. These are the things that are helping our, our loons. You can become an advocate for loons on, on our, our lakes and talk to people uh, about their, their needs. You can bring in your old lead tackle. You know, maybe the most important thing that you can do is get grandpa's dusty old tackle box out of that garage and bring us the tackle in that box. And we're actually paying people now to, to hand us their tackle. So our lead tackle buyback program, we're working with New Hampshire Fish and Game, number of different retailers throughout the state. And if you bring that old tackle, which is now illegal to use or sell in New Hampshire, so it's not doing people any good, but bring it into one of those participating shops. You'll actually get a $10 voucher to buy new loon safe, non-toxic tackle. Um, and if you actually, if you are the person who brings in the largest load of tackle in that tackle shop this year, we'll send you a check for $100 and the second highest for $50. So we're serious about getting this tackle out of, out of our lakes and out of our loons because it's by far the largest source of mortality of our loon population here. So the uh, Loon Preservation Committee benefits from close to a thousand volunteers throughout the state, but we're also a membership organization. And so the uh, memberships help us to, uh, to hire our field biologists, 
uh, and to help us carry out the monitoring and the research and the management and the education that has really been powering the, the, the recovery of loons here in, in New Hampshire. So it's easy to become a member, um, visit our website, loon.org. We would love to have you as a, as a member and you'll be helping to, to help fund the recovery of this iconic bird. One of the most important things that I find that can benefit our loons is just purely education. So to anybody who's interested, you can go to loon.org and our website offers a ton of information, facts, um, question answers. If you want to hear the different sounds or behaviors, see the different behaviors, um, get access to our webcam. So this is a great resource that I recommend. If you log on there, you're going to get lost on the website for a little bit, just, you know, finding out these fascinating facts that will really, um, you know, open your mind to the loon and, um, and you can also come by, visit our loon center. Yeah, I'd encourage folks to come to the Loon Center. It's, this is our headquarters and visitor center in Moultonboro. So the, the work that we do is carried on on lakes throughout the state, um, but the Loon Center is a great uh, resource and it's a great center for education as well. We have all sorts of exhibits. We have uh, taxidermied um, loons, loons that have unfortunately have died of lead poisoning or boat collisions or any number of things, but we try and do some good with those birds and, and even a little gift shop. So next time you're in the area, come on in, stop by um, our Loon Center and and we'd love to tell you stories. There's always someone um, who'd love to talk to you, give you all the information we have. Uh, so we hope that you'll stop in, visit, come see us. So we'll see you on the lake. <laughs>